All right, good morning. This is Jennifer, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study. This is a community Bible study where we will dwell in the Word of God so we can better live our most important purpose, to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. I'm really glad that you're here. Let's get started. So today we have a really a kind of a different lesson. I've never done a lesson like this with you before, and I'm looking forward to it. And um, I think you'll learn learn a lot and thank you for being here for it um, because this will be a fun community time for all of us. If you're on Facebook, don't forget, you can always type in questions and I'll try my best to see them. If you wanna just join me over here on Zoom, it's zoom.com forward slash J and forward slash, let me give you the ID number to log in with, forward slash 809-987-915, 809 987 915 Did you catch that? All right. That's the Zoom ID, and Zoom is a little bit easier for me to engage with us um, in real time, and this might be the day to go ahead and do that. Like I said yesterday in our study, um, we're going to be going back to chapter eight, and today's study is kind of part of the create and share um, that we always do with our Bible studies, and it will give us a chance to go back to chapter eight, and you get the opportunity to write your own Bible study. As it has famously been said, you learn when you teach. You learn when you teach. So simple. And that was said back in Plato's day, like really old, old school, right? So we're going to do that. And you, you don't necessarily need an audience to teach, but you can imagine an audience. So as you're going through our lesson today, we're going to actually be writing your own Bible study through Hebrews chapter eight. So if you'll take your lesson, in fact, let me click over to that page. If you'll take your lesson, you'll see that I've given you plenty of space to do that in. Here we are, lesson eight, day um, 12. Um, we're going to write the words in just a minute, write our verse, and then um, we're going to review chapter eight, and then we'll go into that. But look, it's just blank. <laughs> Isn't there supposed to be a lot of questions there for you to answer? Not today. Different kind of questions. All right, so let's go ahead and get back up here. Let me get my head over in the corner of this of the screen. Those of you who are listening on the podcast are like, "What? What is she doing with her head?" Um, join us on YouTube, by the way, podcasters. Um, every now and then, it's nice to get the visual and see the community. Hello. All right. Thanks for tuning in, by the way. Don't forget to do that when you join us on any one of the platforms, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, or the Dwelling Witchly podcast. Check in and say hi. Leave a comment. Don't just walk in and stare at the screen and leave like being rude. I wouldn't walk into your house and just stare at you and leave. <laughs> say hi and leave a comment. But day after day, you people listen. <laughs> oh, I know there's anonymous people out there listening without leaving comments. Please leave a comment. I'd love to know that you're there. All right, um, let's go ahead and get into chapter eight. I've got that called up today in a unique way also, and I'll explain that more in a minute. So um, let's find verse six. There it is, squished over in the corner and highlighted. And hopefully you have this memorized. Hopefully I have it memorized by now. Um, here we go, Hebrews chapter eight, verse six. But as it is, Christ has obtained. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. Since it is enacted on better promises. All right, awesome. We've already prayed. No, we did not. Do we pray? Oh, for Pete's sake. <laughs> I don't think we prayed. Did I just jump in and we didn't pray? You know what? Even if we did, because I can't remember if we did, we didn't, must have not like prayed, prayed. Let's pray. I want God with us here and I want to really be in that, in that mode. So let's pray. Even if we prayed already, because seriously, all right, we probably didn't because I can't remember it. All right, here we go. Heavenly Father, 
we have this time together right now in your word. And I thank you for everyone listening, joining us right now. Thank you for this community that we have together to get into your word today. We come before you with humility, knowing that we need you. We need your wisdom, your understanding, your truth. And there's a lot of things in our heart that might keep us from really seeing. And we're coming to your word today with a lot of our own understanding, our own wisdom, our own version of truth. And we need you to help us to really wipe anything away that's falsehood. And so help us to come to your word with that kind of humility and openness to learning today. Bless everyone listening and everything that's going on in, in their lives today. We're bringing so much to the table right now. And we just want to lay down our burdens before you and, and be really here with you right now in our time as we go into your word. So thank you ahead of time for the blessing that we'll receive from truly dwelling in your word richly today. In Jesus' name, amen. There we go. Now I feel like I've prayed. All right. So um, our study today, and we'll begin with a review of Hebrews chapter 8. And as you see on the screen, I've called that up. You know what? Just to make it a little easier, can I make it bigger? Oh, yeah, I can. Okay. There we go. That's really, really, really big. <laughs> All right. Let's read that through. Um, I'm not going to read every single translation or version I have listed there. Obviously, that'll come up later. All right. So here we go. Let's read chapter eight and grab your Bible or just follow along on the screen and read chapter eight with me right now. Here we go. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who was seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven a minister in the holy places, in the true chant that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that um, according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, "Behold, the days are coming," declares the Lord, "when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the houses, house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them," declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the old, he makes the first one obsolete and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Get that back down to a regular size here for us. Wow. All right. I like reviewing this with you at the end. We haven't done this before. This was a three-week session. I feel like it's been forever since we've come together and had our in-person Bible study time. So I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys all on Monday and Tuesday. All right. So back over to the lesson. I'll let you read this along with me here. So this is a wrap-up day for Lesson 8, and we've covered a lot. We began Chapter 8 two and a half weeks ago, and now we're back there. You've learned a lot. You've read a lot. Today, after reading Chapter 8 again, please take the role of teacher and write your own study questions through this passage. Here's some tips to help you write effective questions. Let me just read these for you, and then we're going to break it down. I'm going to walk you through a couple of questions. Ask questions that engage with the basic facts of the message. For example, questions that begin with who, what, or when. Engage with the mind. For example, questions that begin with why or how. Connect, with, connect this passage with others in Hebrews as well with other scriptures in the Bible. Help others apply it to their lives. Challenge others to wrestle with a difficult concept. Don't have a yes or no answer. Stir the heart. For example, questions that prod by asking, how does this make you feel? Move others to action. 
Use the space here to write out your questions. Have fun. You'll learn so much more when you think about others and try to imagine moving someone else through the word in an effective way. All right, so let's do this. So let me give you a little bit of my thought process as I go to write the Bible study for you. Because this is a personal Bible study, and the intent originally when I started writing the study was to meet the needs of the women that we have in our church. As I went through and I was shopping online for Bible study possibilities for us, there's a couple of resources that a women's ministry directors and women's pastors like myself can go to, and um, huge stores basically for for pastors to find on um, Bible studies available for women. There's a ton of them out there, fabulous ones that I've used before and authors that I love and respect and have learned so much from. So why, about, why write my own? There's been great Bible studies written on Hebrews. Not a lot for women, I will say though. Um, so when I went to look for a Bible study, this was a couple years ago, I, um, I just wanted to, to meet the needs of the women that we had at the, at the time, what we were going through, um, our spiritual level of maturity, our background, and where I felt like I wanted us to move into the future. And I, uh, I just wasn't feeling like I, I could find a Bible study that fit the length of time that I wanted to study, that fit the depth without being too deep, without being too thin. Um, and really place a strong emphasis on getting into the word. A lot of the Bible studies that I looked at were really more books written by authors that had good Christian themes and were great. They were really inspirational, but they weren't true study. And, um, and then I would find other Bible studies that were more emphasizing on the study, but I found them dry. And I, I knew we, that wouldn't be us as women. We wouldn't really dig that. And others were just super brief. Like if you wanted to do the book of Hebrews, you'd cover it in three weeks, let's say. <laughs> and, um, and so I knew that would be, wouldn't be would cut it because our, our study is designed to either have two sessions. We can either do a fall study in the spring or we can just combine the whole thing, which is kind of what we, we were doing this year through Hebrews, of course. So anyway, point being... Um, I was getting ready to purchase a Bible study that I wasn't feeling really great about, but I thought, I just got to get one. We're, time's running out and we need a Bible study. And I needed to order it because I needed to go through the entire Bible study um, before I taught it. And so that means ordering it about four months ahead of when I give it to you girls. Anyway, um, as I was getting ready to order it, I just felt a really big, like, no from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I like, do not spend the money on this. Don't move forward. This isn't where I want you to go. And then a prompting on that to go ahead and write, to think about where, what our women needed and what I could, that the Holy Spirit would help me to write a study. And that's when I wrote the very first study I did, which was back in the fall of 2016, yeah, 2016, the Hope Bible study, many of you remember. So I wrote that and that was an incredible experience for me. It was the very first time I had ever done anything like that. And I learned a lot in the process, it really resonated with women. And we, I just felt like, Oh, thank you, Lord. This was a great way for us to really connect. And um, ever since then, I've just been writing them. All right. So I wrote for a very, very specific reason and in true obedience, trying to like obey when God said, do not order that, do this instead. And until he says, otherwise, I'll just keep writing the studies. If he says, don't write anymore, I'll stop writing and God will provide some amazing Bible study for us. Right. Um, the second thing I do is when I go to write the Bible studies, number one is obey the Holy spirit. Number two is, um, write with a, with an intent, like know who I want to write for. Like I was saying, um, I have some people in mind when I'm writing, um, our church woman, but for you, as you go to write today, uh, I want you to think about somebody. Um, write the Bible study for a girlfriend of yours, maybe a friend um, who goes to a different church, maybe somebody who's in your, your Bible study group, um, maybe somebody who doesn't go to church at all and would, has been curious and doesn't really know what Bible study is all about. Write with somebody in mind because it'll really impact the way you ask your questions. If you're asking questions of a group of women who are all highly educated in biblical scholarship, then you're going to be digging deep and asking really deep questions um, on, on, on a level of biblical scholarship of a high level, be a graduate degree level. If you're writing for a group of women who are average in their understanding of the Bible, then you're going to stretch them a little bit beyond where they are, but basically ask some fairly average questions. And then if you're writing for somebody 
who has zero Bible knowledge at all. Like you, they're coming into Bible study with nothing at all. They don't know, you know the difference of table of contents to the maps. They don't, they don't know anything. Then you're going to write um, different types of questions as well. If you're writing for someone who's really seeking and skeptical, you're going to write different questions. If you're writing for someone who's really solid in their faith and wants to grow deeper, but it's going through a really difficult time right now, you're going to write different questions. So think about an audience in particular of who you would want to write to and, and write your questions and do your study um, with them constantly in your mind so that you can be prayerful for them and ask God to help you as you go through the study today and, and write out your questions. Okay, so always have your audience in mind, all right? Um, and then when you go to write um, your, your questions, you'll be thinking about that. You'll be having them in mind as you, as you read through those questions and, and formulate them. So the next thing to do when you go to do your study is always have several uh, translations of the Bible available. Now, I've shown you this before, but this is really easy to do. You go to BibleGateway.com. Open up the chapter that you want to look at, and one panel will open up like I've had here. Um, at the top of that panel, you'll see this little symbol. It says Add Parallel, and you just click it, and then you use the drop-down menu to tell you which other parallel versions you would like to see. Now, I've taken some surveys of the women in our church, and I have found out that the four that you're seeing across the screen here are the four most common Bibles that are used by the women in our study. You happen to know that the woman that you're writing for or woman doesn't use any of these and pick a different one. One other version that I do like, and I'll show you how to look it up, is actually, a, oh, it, it's, a, it's auto set. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a paraphrase and it's called the J.B. Phillips. It's a paraphrase. Other paraphrases would be things like the Message Bible, um, the Good News Bible, I think that's a paraphrase, Living Bible, things like that, paraphrase, right? So that's the last one because this isn't a, these are all word for word um, or thought for thought like the international version is. Um, translations are more accurate to the Greek and the Hebrew. This one takes the Greek and Hebrew, but really writes it as if you were just, you know, maybe speaking it from your heart today. Although this was written back in the early 1960s. So it, um, even from then to now, the language has changed a bit. But I like the J.B. Phillips translation. And he's only done the paraphrase, by the way, on the, New Testament. There's no J.B. Phillips for the old, maybe a couple of the books, but anyway, it's not available online. So there you have it. Have all five of those called up and ready to go. The next one is you're going to want to have a Bible um, hub available to you. So with Bible hub, what you're going to do is you're going to same thing, type in Hebrews 8, um, 1, let's say. You start with one verse. And, oh, it's in the dictionary mode. Hold on. Let me get that off there. Let me just go to regular Bible Hub. Bible Hub. Okay, so there's their homepage. You don't want the dictionary page. I had that up. I was researching tithing in the Bible yesterday. Okay, so Hebrews 8, 1. You can see it kind of calls up. And what I like about this is it automatically opens up to multiple versions of the Bible. You see all that? And you just click and it'll give you a new chapter. Really, really helpful. The next thing I like about this is you can go here as it, until it, reset, let it reset, Jennifer. Um, you can go over there. You can see the word where it says interlinear. Mm -hmm. Getting a drink of coffee podcaster so you can hear me slurping. <laughs> I'll click interlinear. And there is, well, that was Hebrew 728. Somehow I clicked over to the wrong verse, but whatever. The point is, you can see, um, this is how you study. And when you have a word you want to look up, you're like, whoa, that's a really interesting word. Or I don't really, what's the root of that? What could that phrase even mean? How did that even get started, right? So this is what you do. You go to Bible Hub. And told you, you're going to learn all my secrets here. <laughs> no secrets here. This is all available to you. I want to empower you to do your own. So what you do then is, let's say, you want to understand what it really means that the law indeed um, um, that the law indeed appointed men is what this verse says in Hebrews 7, 8. You can see it's written in Greek. And because it's written in Greek, it's written in the Greek syntax or word order, the way the words are, we say, um, the law appointed men. And this, it's, it says the law indeed men appoint. So it, it flips it around. All right. So um, let's say I want to find out what this word um, 
a points means or man men means or indeed or high priest or whatever it is so i open up bible hub and i find my word and i um see it written it, these are you can hover over it and see um v for verb uh, pia is present indicative active third person singular that just simply means what it, it's a verb it's not a noun it's a verb um, and then what kind of verb it is well it's an active verb and it's an indicative verb, it's an indicating something, and it's in the present tense. It's not a past tense. He did this yesterday. It's a present tense. And then it's third person singular. Um, and it points um, to, so it's a singular verb, and it points out in the, in the third person. You can totally geek out on that if you're like me and like that, or you can skip it. The next thing you can look up is actually go to the word itself. And this is the actual definition, plain and simple, of that word. Um, it'll also give you a phonetic spelling of it. You can see it's just a um, transliteration. There's a Greek right here. So if, when you learn to pronounce it, you'll see ka, k-a, -A, that's ka, a, theta, iota, um, s, and the t, a, s, and that's another version of s, um, i, and that's their um, n. So this spells ka, this, stain, ka, this, stason. <laughs> and so you just read the transliteration to help you pronunciate it, <laughs> to help you pronounce it. All right. And this is where the really cool stuff happens. Click that number. This is called a Strong's number. Maybe you've heard of the Strong's Concordance. The Strong's Concordance is, a, is an amazing man who took every word of the Bible, every word of the Bible, assigned a number to it, and, um, and then organized it in um, well, what's called a concordance. So that I can look up that word and see where, what verses of the Bible um, uh, use that word. So this is a Strong's word, a number 2525, and it means constitutes. So we click it and look what happens. It opens up all of the occurrences of this word, uh, kathistemi, 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 here we go. Um, or kathistemi, there we go. Kathistemi. Here's the phonetic spelling, really helps right there. All right. Check this out. It gives you all this information about the word. It tells you that it's occurred in the Bible 22 times. It gives you all the iterations of that word. <clears throat> it tells you what verses it's occurred in, in its multiple forms. So you'll see this one is the aorist indicative of uh, third person singular. It's not the uh, present indicative. It's aorist indicative. All right. But I love this that it links to this helps word study. So Strong's did this. Okay. Help us to understand the word. And then helps came along and did this. Strong's word 25, 25. Um, Kathistami um, is from the root word. And there's a Strong's for the root, kata, down. And Strong's for the root, um, histami, to stand. And maybe you recognize, this is where you're going to listen to. You're going to try to say it out loud like I've just been doing. It's really important to say these words out loud, by the way. Because you'll hear it and you'll go, hey, that sounds like our word. We have a word for that, histamine, 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 antihistamine. In it, so um, a histamine comes from this word to stand, and so when your your system stands up and on alert, <laughs> um, it it's it's on a, standing up on alert inside your body, right? So you might take have to take an antihistamine to get your body to inner body to calm down. That's an antihistamine, anyway. Um, but that's where it comes from. Okay, and then. You can dig into the word origins here more. You can see um, more details about that. And again, the Greek and all that, if you want to really nerd out. So enjoy Bible Hub. I use this a lot um, because Hebrews is a unique book of the Bible. It has more singular use uh, words than any other book of the Bible. In Hebrews, it has 175 words in the book of Hebrews that only occur in the book of Hebrews and no other book of the Bible. And, um, and so that's, that's really unique, by the way. But a few, most of the books have a, a, a unique word or phrase that are unique to that book, but nobody comes close to Hebrews, 175. I would say an average book might have five unique words in it. Maybe some of Paul's writings might have 20 but um, Hebrews, crazy off the charts on these unique words. That's what makes it really cool to do these word studies and bring this together. Because even scholars read them and go, what? 
<laughs> and here's what's interesting also. It'll tell you where in history and when in history other people have used it. Let me see if I can find an example of that. Let's see, in Greek writings. Okay, so this word is used in Greek writings from Herodotus down. So this is, you guys have to understand, this isn't just someone like, oh, I think this was used a long time ago. This was used from people who really understand linguistics, um, the history of language, and really study all of this. And they've made it all available for free for us to dig in. So please, this is why we call this the Dwelling Richly Bible Study. Um, of course, that's based on the, our verse in um, Colossians that says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. But this is what we do then when we get into the word. We really want to dig into it and not just go like, oh, look at me doing my little Bible study, done and done, check it off of my list of to-do. The concept here is to really embrace the word of God and to to dwell in it and to love doing that like we're supposed to love the Lord our God with our mind. Thank you. All right. So let's go back to Hebrews 8 and write a question. The important thing to do at the beginning is read the entire chapter. Make sure you've read a little bit before chapter 7, a little bit coming up chapter 9 so you know where you're going. And then for sure read all of chapter 8. The first read through in your Bible, not online, do not read it through online, open up an actual, your actual real Bible. And I have a couple of my Bibles here. This is my NIV, I mean my ESV study Bible. Um, but I, this one I use for reference and I have the entire thing online now, so I don't tend to use this one as much. But my, my um, personal study Bible is just, I've shown you before, those of you who followed the Dwelling Witchley Bible study, you've seen it. It is literally just scripture in the middle of the page. Um, oh man, it's right over there and I should have set it up when we got started. I didn't do it. Anyway, you've seen it before. I've shown it to you in multiple other Bible studies, but here's the idea. You're going to use a Bible, a real actual paper Bible, and i I really strongly recommend that you get some kind of a highlighter that's safe to use in your Bible, a pencil that's safe to use, and, and get willing to study and write in your Bible. Um, you'll, you'll go through multiple Bibles in your life, potentially, but use, get a Bible that you want to own for your personal study that you can write your own notes in, and it'll be a sort of a journal of your journey. Um, um, personally, you might go back to a scripture that you studied a while ago, and your notes that you've seen, and go... Oh, I, I didn't even remember I had that thought process about that verse. And maybe your thought process has changed and you can write a new note then in that space. That's why I like mine. Here's what mine looks like. Here's the wide margin. That means the Bible is in the middle. Um, the text is in the middle. The references, I'll call, talk about those in just a second. The references go down the center and all around the outside edge uh, is plenty of space, a full inch on the top left, right, and bottom, and all that, um, to write notes. And then I make use of um, a really good pencil that can write fine and thin, and I also make use of some post-it notes every now and then. If I know it's just a fleeting thought, I don't need it to be permanently written in. All right, read the word. Get prepped to study the word, and then start breaking it down verse by verse. So let's take a look at the first one. Now the point um, in what we are saying is this. Okay, awesome, you can stop right there. You can say, oh, well, what's the point? And you need to make sure you know what he's been talking about. So when he opens up with a point like this, you're thinking in your mind, oh, yeah, chapter and verses weren't normally li weren't listed there when he was writing this. He's just been moving on through his talk, his sermon, or his note, his you know written letter, and he's continuing on this point that he's been making. So you need to make sure you know the point. So an opening question might be something along the lines of, what point has he's been moving to as he's been going through chapters six and seven and ask your, um, those who follow along with you, ask them to, to answer that. Those who are going to be completing your study. Um, what point has he been making? Now, if this is a standalone chapter and no one's going to be having read chapter seven, the person you're writing it for, then don't do that. You tell them in your intro, open up a little intro and tell them. All right. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Pause right there, at the end of verse one. Now, what you're gonna do through this is take a look at that verse one and ask yourself a question. Do I really understand every word that's in that verse? Do I understand the words? Um, number two, knowing the person that I'm writing this for, am I, 
I'm going to make some strong, intelligent assumptions here, but do I think they understand just the basics of those words? If the answer is yes, awesome. Do I ask an affirming question that's very simple to get going um, on related to some of these words? For example, high priest. So you might want to ask a question that's related to the first one I wrote, which, which is simply engage with the basic facts of the passage. For example, a question, questions that begin with who or what or when. These are really simple no-brainer type questions, right? That should get everybody's juices flowing. We have such a high priest. Ask the question. Um, uh, what are some um, examples of high priests in the Bible? Who has been a high priest in the Bible? Easy. So um, a what, a who, or when. These are just basic black and white Q&A. Next is one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Okay. So this is one of your connecting ones. Have you read anywhere else in Hebrews about being seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty? So all my amazing Bible study students who have been with us since the beginning, you should be going, yes, yes, we have. We've totally read about that. And it was at the very beginning of Hebrews. Do you recall? Let's take a look. That should have triggered right there, seated at the right hand. Let me go ahead and open up get that off there let me go ahead and open up another bible gateway page here excuse us we are almost i'm drinking coffee again so if i slurp you'll hear me so hebrews what is it come on i'm not going to type it in i want you to think where have we read about jesus being seated at the right hand it's got to come up a couple of times all right, fine. I'm going to write it. I'm not going to write it in the verse. I'm going to write it out like this, seated. And let's see what search results that comes up with in Hebrews. <laughs> Ta -da, look at that. So you go click Hebrews and it shows you. Hebrews 8.1 and 12.2 is going to come up. Oh, it doesn't do the one. I probably chose the wrong word. All right, I'll go back to the beginning. Here it is. Oh, I know. It's a different version of the word seated. All right, so Hebrews 1. It's in the very beginning. Um, he's a radiance of the glory of the exact imprint after um, purification of sins. He, what, sat down. I should have looked up right hand. But anyway, that's my process. That's where I, why I go through to ask questions for you. I think, where did that happen before? I want people to be making those connections. Okay. So go back to our, our lesson over here. All right. So that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to do in this today's lesson with you is to give you some of my background of how I write this, how do I write the study and hopefully encourage you to do the same. You know, three years ago, I, I dreamt of doing something like this with the women in our Bible study, but we just weren't, we just weren't there yet. And I know right now we are, and some of you are at this um, lesson today going, Yay, I cannot wait to write this. And others of you are like, uh, I don't know if I can write these questions. I get it. I get it. And then there's people all in between. And of course, there's some people who don't even do the Bible study. <laughs> they just show up each week, every week with nothing done. I know. It's everything in between. I get it. And my heart would be that everybody would just love the Bible study and really do it. And we'd show up together and everybody would have it all done. And we'd really engage with each other and grow. We would move so fast. You guys would be blown away. Um, I have a dream for that. I have a dream. Um, but um, we're not there yet. <laughs> Eventually we will be. All right. Welcome and thank you. I should say welcome to you now starting because that's the next step. You're going to jump into the word on your own. And um, so stop, stop listening to this as soon as I sign off here. Uh, as time permits, go to your word and, and dig in and um and be blessed as you do and please also remember that when you check in and let me know that you've been listening it gives me the opportunity to see your name and pray for you by name and know that you are loved and prayed for until we meet again i look forward to, to seeing you and definitely we'll be praying for you bye bye for now